How much do you know about Nintendo? Do you think that you know a lot of things? Or do you think actually maybe you don't know a lot of things and know a little few things instead? We're gonna be reacting to 43 of Nintendo's biggest secrets by Mr. Who's the Boss, who is a tech YouTuber. So I feel like with us being our big gamer minds who game a lot and use video games, we would know so many of these things. We're gonna keep track and see how many we don't know, how many we do know, and you can come together at the end and see, did you beat me? Did you lose? Let's find did out. Did you know Nintendo has been around since 1889? Whoa like literally yes. the time of the Ottoman Empire. That they have an official accessory that's a one-to-one -one of a revolver, or that until Mario came- Maybe? A one-to-one -one of a revolver? Is that the- They had a gun accessory for like a really old console back in the day, didn't they? I can't remember exactly what it's called, but all I can remember now is that stupid VR headset that they made in like the 90s that was really terrible, and I can't remember the gun, so I'm gonna say no for that one. Oh, Nintendo's mascot was meant to be Discun. Yeah. Discun? Oh, it's really cute. On the manuals for lots of early games in Japan, but as soon as Nintendo saw people's reaction to Mario, he was very quickly buried, but has shown up in a lot of places as an Easter egg, including the surprisingly awesome Mario Bros. movie. Oh, that's cool. I, I genuinely had no idea about that, so now I'm gonna chalk that up one as a no. You know Nintendo, right? You think that yeah. this normal gaming company who made a couple of consoles? Well, normal. Uh, I don't know about that. Things that you didn't know that will completely switch that image right around. So All right, let's do it. What's Nintendo doing all the way back in 1889? I mean, they, I know what they're doing. They, I'm going to chime in before he even says anything. They were making playing cards because they, you may not be believe this. There were no video game back in 1889. They had to grow up without video game. No Mario and even no Zelda. They were playing playing cards, doing Go Fish. They weren't making Mario Kart, that's for sure. This company actually started out making Hanafuda cards in Japan, which became really popular really quickly because the government had recently outlawed most forms of gambling, but Nintendo's Hanafuda managed to loophole their way around that. And the gambling laws in Japan are very interesting. Like, you can't do any kind of real gambling, but you can go to pachinko areas and play on the pachinko machines and then take the rewards that you get from the pachinko machines and take it to a different area across the street into a different building, into a different business, and use those pachinko tokens to exchange for other things. So it's, it's basically like gambling, and you can get the rewards for gambling but you, you can't gamble, it's very strange. And so, if you ever wondered what Nintendo actually means, it can either be translated to leave luck to heaven, a reference to gambling, or the Whoa. literal temple of free Hanafuda. Free emphasizing the fact that Nintendo's Hanafuda were allowed and not outlawed. But Why do Japanese companies have such cool names, like temple of free or leave it to heaven, leave luck to heaven, whereas us in uh, the the Western countries in the UK, we've got bloody Poundland, <laughs> America McDonald's. What does that mean? It's it's just a name, but McDonald's. After years of this, something crazy happened. The president of Nintendo at the time, while visiting one of the company's Hanafuda factories, spotted this extending arm-like toy. It had been made. I had one of those. Maintenance engineers, Gunpei Yokoi, just for a bit of fun, but. President loved it. And sensing that Nintendo was starting to reach their limits when it comes to playing cards, he ordered Yokoi to actually develop this toy into a real Nintendo product just in time for the Christmas rush. So oh, that's so cool. Wait, the the art for it is just a kid stealing his dad's wallet. He's like, oh yeah, steal your dad's wallet, guys. That's the one thing you're supposed to do with this. Steal money from your parents. Did, and it ended up being called the Ultra Hand. Thus, basically over Ultra Hand. Wait. The Ultra Hands? No! That's where they got the name for the mechanic in Zelda. It's called Ultra Hand. It's something that you can grab objects from, from miles away, and it's in Zelda now. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that. Nintendo from a card company to a toy company. And this guy Gunpei from a regular maintenance guy to basically chief inventor. That turned out to be a pretty good decision since he's- Chief the... inventor is a crazy name to have at any company. Man who later down the line ended up creating Nintendo's first ever handheld game console, the Game & Watch, the even more iconic Game Boy. And he's also the one who's responsible for basically the entire way that Nintendo operates. You know how people always complain that compared to PlayStation and Xbox, Nintendo is consistently behind in terms tech. But yeah, yeah, I think that's on purpose because they want to keep the price lowered so that more families can purchase things. Maybe lower income families can get it for their kids and things like that. They never use the latest components. Well, 
This was Gunpei Yokoi's entire design philosophy that he called lateral thinking with withered technology. The idea that people don't need cutting edge tech to have fun, it just requires the company True. to do some out the box thinking. And if you can do that, you can have the same levels of success with far less cost. And they've kept that philosophy to this day. They still do that. They're like, ah, we don't have to have the best tech, but you know what? We have a handheld console that you can plug in and now it's a TV console as well. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool that you can do that? You don't need the latest iPhone to be able to enjoy Vimeo game. You just need it to be fun. You're looking for it. I apologize if I've ruined Nintendo for you, but you will see traces of this vision across every one of their products. This is why Nintendo's first Game & Watch used the same fixed image display as a calculator. And why- But they did use cutting edge technology on the Wiimote. They must have used the latest motion technology to be able to get the Wiimote to work because the Wiimote is, for 2007, a pretty sick piece of tech. Like, it was very consistently usable. Today's Nintendo Switch released with a chipset that was two years old, even when it launched. Am I happy about it? Not really. Is the Switch still my most played current console by far? Yes, it is. This guy, Yokoi, was Fair such enough. a big part of Nintendo's success over the years that Nintendo later decided to honor his contributions with a real video game titled Grill Off with Ultra Hand. And okay. Ultra you can't steal your dad's wallet in that though, so what's the point? And wasn't the only toy Nintendo ended up making. Seeing the success of Lego in the late 1960s, who just introduced the concept of a wheel, which changed the entire paradigm of what was possible. Lego, boring. Lego with wheel. Oh, that, that's crazy. What? They're not with wheel? They started to think, yeah, we can do that too. And very shortly pivoted their efforts towards building their own Lego-like NB building blocks. They had ads directly- Nintendo Lego? Their blocks to Lego to show how their revolutionary circular design was more appealing. And Lego sued them. Oh, what? <laughs> Nintendo actually- won. Oh, I guess it did look exactly the same as Lego, huh? There aren't really that many competitors to Lego. There's like building blocks, mega blocks is what it's called, I think. Lawsuit, but only later realized, thanks to their very peed off customers, that actually the pieces all being so rounded made them work together much less well than Lego. It wasn't until- Yeah, it does not look like something that would click together very well. 1977 that Nintendo's true trajectory was set when they released the Color TV game, their first ever video game console. With each version of the console only able to play one single game. Imagine that nowadays. Sony releases the PS6, says you can only play Gollum on it. Right. Yes, that'd be a no. I, what do you mean? That's such a good investment. What the hell? You can only play one game. If you can only play one game for the rest of your life, what would it be? It would have to be something that you can replay pretty much endlessly. Something that is maybe online. Something that is gonna last you a very long time. Something that won't have its multiplayer servers shut down at some point because if they have them shut down, no more Vimeo game. So what would it be? I, I don't know, maybe for me it would be like Baldur's Gate 3, even though it just came out, so maybe I have recency bias. Right, so that's basically Nintendo's history. Time for some surprising durability facts. I really hope we caught that. The Nintendo DS is the only console to have survived a trip all the way up to the top of Mount Everest. The moisture, the icy cold temperatures, the wind, the spilled curry apparently. Even when all other professional- the Spilled curry? The climbers were carrying failed. This is what lived on. During the Wait, why were they taking all this electronic equipment to the top of Mount Everest? People just be going on holidays now. They really just be doing things. In war in 1990, a medic had left his Game Boy in a tent, and that tent got bombed. Now, naturally, you'd assume Ooh. any possession of yours that gets bombed is a write-off. You'd throw it away. But just for what seemed like a bit of a sick joke, this medic decided to send his melted Game Boy in for repair when he got back. Seen this image. Tent. I've seen this image. Repair stuff yep. When they received this fry Game Boy and stuck a game of Tetris in just to try and see if it was even repairable. It still works. It wasn't just repairable, but it actually still worked. I can't believe it's still on. Do they constantly have this Game Boy on? I feel like no piece of tech now would work this long. Actually, my dad was in the Gulf War, so this is uh, interesting to me. It's very strange like, to hear that a random Game Boy got bombed in the same war that my dad was like currently fighting in. It's very strange. I wonder if he was close to the Game Boy. I'm gonna text him and be like, were you <laughs> gonna send him a picture of this image and be like, do you recognize this Game Boy, Dad? Oh, good one, Jenkins. Looks like we just made it out of the tent before it was exploded by the enemy. Did you save the Game Boy? Yeah, that was a close one. The, the Game Boy? Yeah, the, the Game Boy, the, the, the one with Tetris. No, I, I I thought the medical supplies would be more important. Oh man, I just got a new high score in that. But it gets crazier because the Game Boy was also the first console ever to be taken to space. In space? I mean, oh, 
course you're going to need Game Boy in space. What else are you going to do in space apart from float? In 1993, Russian cosmonaut Alexander Serebrov spent an astonishing 196 days in the Russian space station with the handheld and a copy of Tetris. Only Tetris? Oh man, you can be kind of bored. I guess you can play Tetris, Tetris kind of endlessly though. It's not like a game that you just finish and you're like, ah, that's it. You can just kind of keep so, playing it. Remind him what gravity feels like. Like all cosmonauts, I love sports. My particular... <laughs> he was like, oh, that's right. Of course, thing go down. <laughs> I've completely forgot that. The favorites are football and swimming. During flight, in rare minutes of leisure, I enjoy playing Game Boy. Wrote nice. Several in an autographed note that accompanies the game and his Game Boy in a 2011 auction. See Wait, wait, hold on, the 2011 auction, the first Game Boy that was flown in space by one of the first people ever to go to space only sold for $1,220? I'm sorry, you got shit selling for like tens of thousands of dollars in terms of just video game memorabilia. And the first Game Boy in space that potentially might still function, 1,200, that seems, that seems kind of low. That seems a little low. So yeah, if there's one brand of consoles that you could confidently take to war with you, it's Nintendo. But what about the weirdness of Nintendo's characters? Like how Mario in the original Donkey Kong arcade where he first appeared, wasn't meant to be Mario. Nintendo actually wanted to use Popeye as the main protagonist, but just really? licensing rights. And it's only then that they realized that they actually need a character of their own. So they decided to create Jumpman. Yeah, I think the creative team were having a day off. But Jumpman over the coming years became Mario. And Mario as a character now has managed to sell Nintendo over 800 million video games. That's fucking Jesus Christ. Almost a billion, baby. Almost a billion. We're almost there. I genuinely think Popeye is one of the greatest old cartoons in the world. He shows off that masculine energy, but he's also respectful towards women. He gets them with the rock'em sock'em robot punch. He eats spinach, promoting healthy lifestyles. What does Popeye not Did have, you truly? Why Mario's gorilla nemesis is called Donkey Kong. Well, donkey in a Japanese to English dictionary is an adjective meaning stubborn. And Nintendo wanted to make it immediately obvious to passers-by arcades that the enemy character is a stubborn ape. Zelda is named after the famous novelist and playwright- I did Zelda. not know that. It's Gerald, for some reason. I think they just liked her name. There was Zeldas before Zelda? That's, I don't, well, and where right. does Link's name come from? It's not short for Lincoln. Well, I'm okay, I'm gonna make a prediction. The Link name is supposed to be uh, symbolic between the link between the character and the player. Link adds, asks at link is the link between the game and the person playing it. That's why it's called Link. Um, that's my prediction. The very first Zelda game was originally going to feature time travel, with Link being the literal link between past and future. They okay. did go on mm. to use this concept in later Zelda games, but a lot of people didn't know that this was the intention right from the very beginning. I was close, if I was close, I was close. Game box art in Japan versus the US, you'll notice his face is angrier in the US and He's future pissed. in Japan. And this is intentional. Nintendo found from their market research that all demographics in Japan responded well to cuteness, but that in the US, they felt like they needed Kirby to be cool more than cute because- That's true. I mean, you see in Japan, like everything has Hello Kitty merchandise everywhere. Just Hello Kitty all over the place. They didn't think that boys would play otherwise, which is hilarious since Kirby was very nearly going to be called Tinkle Popo. <laughs> I think that would have been cool. Okay, Popo. Popo is a decent name. Tinkle Popo is not going to sell a single copy in America. You see, like, an American young boy between 8 and 12 in the 90s in America, they're not going to be caught dead with a video called video game called Tinkle Popo. They'll get bullied for that, 100%. One of Nintendo's top lawyers, John Kirby, owns... They could have been going after the, the female audience potentially with that though, I don't know. Exclusive worldwide right to name sailboats Donkey Kong as a very strange thank you gift for winning Nintendo a massive lawsuit. This was a huge case, by the way. What? Funnily enough, from Universal, who tried to sue them saying that Donkey Kong was fringing on the rights of King Kong. Oh, and they also bought him a $30,000 boat for him to name the Donkey Kong. Okay, is a $30,000 boat that good? I mean, I understand inflation. This is in the past, so inflation, but I feel like yachts are just insanely expensive. Maybe I've only seen like mega yachts though. A $30,000 boat, that's probably like a nice, a nice boat back in the day, right? That's less funny than this idea of a God-given right of you, and only you can name your boat Donkey Kong. It's funny. But then also, notice something interesting about that guy's name, John Kirby. So oh. the reason that Kirby didn't end up being called Tinkle Popo was this guy right here. 
damn, this guy has a stranglehold around Nintendo's balls. He's like, I am Donkey Kong. I am Kirby. Unsung hero. Right, just before we get to the Easter eggs, which, not gonna lie, is my absolute favorite thing, I wanna show you how, even though Nintendo does tend to stick to less cutting edge tech in their machines, that it's also impossible to deny how much they've innovated in their own way. They were the okay. first to bring in the concept Whoa. of a deep Dude, the editing on this channel is just insane. There is no other channel that edits in the same way. It's fast paced, but also very clear. It's very clean. The movement is smooth. I would say the editing is very smooth on this channel. It's just absolutely crazy. There's a reason he's one of the biggest tech YouTubers. I fucking love this channel. Or directional pad, funnily enough, also engineered by our guy Gunpei. Same for the analog stick, which appeared on the N64 in 1996 before- That was the first analog stick? Or Sega could beat them to the punch. They wow. mainstreamed the ability to save game progress why did they put it there? They, they made the first analog stick and they put it somewhere where the hands just would not go. Cartridges in the West. Instead of having to use floppy drives, they basically installed tiny batteries into the cartridges, which basically keep the game running in a really low power state when taken out, which is needed so that it doesn't reset to its original state without progress. These cartridge what? batteries have lasted 20, 30 years, with grown adults even now carrying on their childhood save files. I did not realize the batteries were to keep the cartridge functioning until they are next used. I thought the batteries were just, I, I don't know what I thought the batteries for. I just knew that the batteries were there and that when your battery runs out, you lose your save on Pokemon games. And people were sad about that. So you can replace the battery to make it last longer. I did not realize it kept it going. It's like on, it's like on all the time. That's so cool. Nintendo made the first shoulder buttons appearing on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System at a time where developers were scratching their heads thinking, what on earth do we do with all of these inputs? Which is yeah, I guess Br Obama was a developer before he was president. <laughs> because nowadays we have two times that. Nintendo introduced controller rumble in 1997 with the rumble pack for your N64 controllers. Dude, they just made everything to do with control. Is there anything that they didn't do apart from maybe like voice? The PlayStation has audio coming out of their controllers. Nintendo did seemingly everything yeah, else. At a time where the idea of a controller that could vibrate interactively with what was happening in the game felt like a whole new unexplored dimension. So many big gaming features that we nowadays just take for granted. Nintendo were the ones who either invented them or popularized them. And then- yeah, Seriously, they're insane. How are they so creative? They must have seven employees that hired just to think of idea all of the time. Just think of idea. Just sit there. Just think. Just say you just go you go into office and you sit down and you, you think of idea and then you write idea down and send it to engineers. It was the virtual boy. The first ever mass produced virtual oh, yeah, this thing. system. Which is crazy considering that this is 1995 we're talking about. The and year it was that sucks. Was born. But this was also a pretty good example of why you shouldn't always rush to be first. The virtual boy was VR but long before VR was good enough to make the tech usable. It could only display images in black and red, which ended up giving people headaches. It red is such a strange color to have for this. With no good games because Nintendo was too busy prepping for the N64 that they knew would be a hit. And the main problem was that while initially conceived as a lightweight set of goggles that you could wear and take anywhere, the Virtual Boy- <laughs> You need to have a stand for it. You need to set it up like it's a camera. It being so heavy that Nintendo had to build and ship a custom stand with it that required you to use it on a table and lean into it. Make nah, why don't you just have stronger neck muscles, honestly? Okay, it looks like the Virtual Boy is about ready to ship but it says here it's 760 grams. Isn't that not a bit weighty? Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't it be? I don't think an eight year old's neck can support this. Oh, see, that's the problem with this generation. Weak neck muscles. Went like this back in my day. So we've talked a fair bit about the inventor, Gunpei Yokoi, but he isn't the only weirdly well-known Nintendo executive. Because compared to other companies like Sony and Microsoft, who tend to keep one or two public facing figures. Phil, I know Phil like, Spencer. Who the fuck is Jim Ryan? To put their developers at the front and center to the point where they become almost as beloved as the company's actual characters. Like Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of the Super Mario and the Legend of Zelda games. Legend? Basically the architect of a lot of people's childhoods. What I thought was so cool is that he created the original Zelda on NES is arguably the first open world game because he wanted to give players the same feeling he had as a kid, exploring outdoors in his hometown, especially the feeling- It's crazy how many of these great video games have come from just childhood adventures and childhood dreams. Like Zelda came from someone going outside and fumbling around in the woods. Pokemon came from the original creator just going out and collecting bugs. And he was like, ooh, what if I made a bug collecting game? But what if they weren't actually bugs? What if they were fire breathing demon creatures instead? In discovering a cave, i.e. the very first thing you do in the game to get your sword. Or like the current president of Nintendo of America, whose name is literally Doug Bowser. 
That's the fact. And fun as that is, even he has not yet lived up to the legendary meme overlord status of the previous Reggie. president of Nintendo America. Reggie fills Amy. What? I think it's actually pronounced Reggie fils me, but I prefer my version. So does Amy. <laughs> <laughs> who came in hard with his very first introduction to the fans at E3 2004. And it's not just this, Reggie- He's high energy, man. A golden moment. Dude, he's imposing on a stage as well. He just comes up, he's imposing, he's a big guy. And he just says words and you're like, you know what, Reggie, I love you. Thank you so much. Like, my body is ready. Which then became, my body is Reggie. And then him actually adopting the fan nickname of the Reginator. And then this <laughs> water, who was the president ah, the girl. of the entire we love him. from 2002 until his tragic passing in 2015. There are a million stories you could tell about Iwata. Like the fact that when the Wii U was failing and tanking Nintendo's entire stock value. He cut his own salary because they had to cut a lot of things from the company because Nintendo was doing really badly. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to be taking proper responsibility for how the company is performing right now, and I'm gonna cut myself. Why can't other CEOs do that? Uh-oh, we need to make some cuts. Looks like all of the workers are going to have to suffer for a bit. Not my bonus though, certainly not. This guy outright refused to fire any employees and instead cut his own salary in half. Or Go. he's the reason that the second generation of Pokemon games feature both the region from the second game and the entire first it's game not. bundled into one. The dev That's team not was true. struggling already just to fit in one region, but Iwata was so insistent that he wanted to give the fans more that he single-handedly developed a compression tool so powerful that it not only saved the game's entire development, but allowed them to stuff almost another full game in there too. Okay, that one is not actually true. We actually watched a Did You Know Gaming video about this recently. It is not that he stuffed more into the game. He actually made a algorithm that took up more space on the game, but allowed it to run a lot faster. So instead of every single movement, every menu access, every battle enter and battle exit taking longer, it took shorter. It was like speeding up the game. It made it faster, which I would argue actually is probably for the player's perspective, a much better thing to do because you're respecting a player's time and you're making the game run faster rather than just stuffing more stuff into it. I think that's probably a better thing that they did. And if you're enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be Nintendo dopamine. Yeah, no, okay, sure. <laughs> That's good, okay, so no, yeah, launch, that was good. Switch had a hidden Easter egg left in there by developers in memory of Iwata, a ROM of NES Golf, the first game he worked on at Nintendo, which would only appear when you and what a game directly to you gesture with both Joy-Cons, which he would do at the start of every Nintendo Direct presentation. Speaking of NES Golf and Aww, that's Easter cute. Eggs, no one seems to know this, but the golf course in Wii Sports, enjoyed by tens of millions, is actually the exact same course layout first created in NES Golf in 1987, but just now in 3D which is both really cool to see the original ideas brought to life and also one really smart way to save yourself drawing out new courses. They also- Yeah, regardless of whether or not you like these, you can tell they put a lot of time and effort and just a lot of love into this. They, they really cared about what they were making here, regardless of, you know, whether it was super good or not. Reuse those same courses for Clubhouse games on the Switch. The GameCube launch jingle has two secret alternatives. So this is what the normal one sounds like. Okay. But if yep. you hold Z on your controller, it makes a squeaky dog sound. And then if you what? plug in all four controllers and hold- How? I, I, I had a GameCube, how do I not know this? Z on all of them, it turns into a traditional Japanese drum theme to honor the console's country of origin. What? I have never, I did not know this, what the fuck? All right. It's an homage to the GameCube. When you have to press the same button three times to launch your current Nintendo Switch, I imagine most people just mash the A button, but if you press either ZR or ZL or click in the sticks, it'll make similarly unusual sounds. If you boot up a DS oh, on your so birthday, cool. the boot jingle will be more sparkly. On Wii U, your Miis will sit there and applaud you. Also, Nintendo PictoChat will display a happy birthday message when you join a room. Oh, and this is Aww. so cool. This is all cute. It's the same thing as when you go to the Pokemon Center when it's your birthday in a Pokemon game, they're like, happy birthday. And I'm sitting there like, well, how do you know that? How do you know it's my birthday? I've never told you my birthday before. You're just a random nurse that I met recently on the street. I don't even, I've never been here before. This is the first time I've ever even come to this town. I'm a child, I'm a 10 year old. How do you know my birthday? I'm gonna I'm call, I'm calling call, call the police. I'm doing it. Call the police, this is weird. On the DSi's sound editor, if you record any sound and leave it idle for a minute, the console will remix that sound into the Super Mario Bros theme. If you transfer your data from the Wii to the Wii U, the data will actually be carried by Pikmin, which are iconic I've done this. characters at this point. They put way more effort into this animation than they really needed to. The little goobas, I mean, who is transferring data like this on a regular basis? They, they put so much time into that. It. The GameCube has a microscopic dolphin printed on one of its chips, referencing the fact that dolphin was the console's 
code name during development. And if you've ever wondered, this is how- And that's why the emulator is called Dolphin. That's oh, cute. The Dolphin emulator that lets you play Nintendo games on other machines found its name. And another physical hidden Easter egg, which has got to be my favorite, since a lot of you can go and find this right now. If you tilt yeah. your Switch Pro controller's right stick down, shine a torch at the top of it, you can just about see, thanks to all game fans printed on the circuit board. Oh my god, how do, this is crazy. I, how do you even find stuff like that? Who's doing that? I've learned something new today. You know what? I love these videos. I love the editing. I would highly recommend, if you care about tech at all, go subscribe to Nissan who's the boss, their videos are fantastic. If you want to see more of my dumb face, then you can always subscribe to this channel as well.